You're watching Face to Face. I'm your host, Tim Vince, and I'm delighted to be joined uh, by David Ingle, the founder of Burning Heart. It's great to be here. You're wonderful. It's really great to see you. And the, um, we'll talk about Burning Heart, but I've, we've had some great discussions about a whole <laughs> host of things that have nothing to do with our, the subject of our interview, but it's interesting to chat. And uh, David, where, do, where and how did you come into you know, the Christian faith? And, We'll talk later about what it led to. Uh, well, I was very blessed to grow up in a Christian family. Uh, Mum and dad both love the Lord Jesus. And from uh, as, as young as I can remember, even when I was a little, little boy, um, just always being introduced to God. Uh, we went to HTB as a family when I was growing up. Um, so I went to the Sunday school there. Wow. I remember my mum explaining the Lord's Prayer to me and what it meant for God to be my father. And she just said, he's like, daddy, only better. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't remember any moment in my life when God wasn't part of it, although there's been then lots of moments along the way where I've had to make decisions to, to follow God for me now. Yeah, so that's, that's quite a story because HDB is so well known around the world, mm. but you were actually there influencing. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I was influencing, but I do. I, one of my earliest memories mm. is sitting after the morning service, there was a whole congregation meeting yeah to discuss whether or not um, the robe choir should continue oh, wow. in the morning services. And wow. you say that now and people went, sorry, sorry, robe yeah. choir at HDB? <laughs> Was that, were you there in the Sandy Miller days yes. then, in the Sunday In the John school? Collins days. Okay, actually. wow, that's, so, I didn't want to be too rude well, on your age. Yeah. I'm in my 40s now. We're not supposed to date stamp the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the programme, but um, that is, that's amazing. So pre-Alpha, Yes. you were there. Although I think Alpha, Alpha was running in the church, but it was pre-Alpha going yeah. everywhere else. Although, to be fair, you know, obviously when I was you yeah. know, tiny, I, I mean, as soon as I was old enough to understand, there was quite a lot of Alpha, 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 yeah. and Alpha was... was now, there, there's another thing that uh, I, um, I am a, I, an outsider. I've never been to HTV. <laughs> driven past and thought, oh, I'd love to pop in there. But um, they're well known for um, planting churches. I'm interested in this because my daughter's part of a plant, you know, another church plant. And so just, just tell me when that started, because that's quite a strategic thing. Yeah, I think the first church plant was 1985, wow. um, St Barnabas Kensington. Mm. Um, and it was quite a sort of new model. I mean, there'd been a lot of church planting in the States, but I think that church planting in America had always been, you, you just completely start something fresh and new whereas HTB was always church planting within the context of the Church of England. Yeah. So that the church was never a new church. There was always a, a building there, yeah. a history. Some of them had, you know, long and illustrious histories mm. and just been difficult for a few years. Others, you know, newer, I'm sure they all had some form of history. But that can save money then. If you're, but you're basically taking on a defunct church, let's mm. say, I've yes. not being too rude about it. Well, many, so. I mean, St. Peter's yeah. Brighton, actually, where I got married, because yeah. my, um, my wife was a part of the I'm congregation. I just going to ask you, you know, <laughs> are you married? But go on. Well, what she was part of the, the congregation okay. at St. Peter's. Interesting. And uh, so I know, and also it's one of the sort of, you know, Archie Coates, who's the vicar of HTB yeah. now, yeah. was the person who planted St. Peter's and was the first outside London. Yeah. And, you know, I think it was literally about to be sold. The church had been closed down, there was no congregation at all. Um, you, I, I don't know if it got as far as the for sale sign going yeah. outside the church, yeah. but it was oh, properly to be, defunct. Yeah, advertised <laughs> as a new yoga centre or exactly. karate club, yeah. Um, so, you, so, and you've been involved in this, this kind of um, strategy of church planting. Is, is, it, 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 is there a lot of training that goes into it or just some, how, how does it come about? And how many are there now? that just from HDB. I, I mean, knew you'd ask me that. And the, the answer is I don't know. I don't think quite hundreds, oh, right, but okay. sort of, you know, the high, high tens, maybe okay. nudging to a hundred. Okay, amazing. Um, I mean, I've been involved, I, I don't want to oversell myself no, as I've been no. involved in the strategy. That yeah, makes no. it sound like I was sort yeah. of in, in Nicky and Sandy's inner circle. Yeah. Um, whereas for most of my life, I've been watching from, from the pews, as it were, yeah. although yeah. no pews anymore, no. but you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I was privileged to lead um, one of the plants myself in mm. the City of London. So I do, I do have experience of it. Yeah. And I think there is a lot of, of investment that goes into it. You know, so um, I led a uh, plant and I'd first of all gone through the whole Church of England selection process. Mm. I'd been trained 
sort of more generally as a clergy, as pastor at, at Wycliffe Hall, which is a wonderful yeah. theological college. Yeah. I'd done a curacy, um, and, and then specifically there was a church planting course, uh, which I went on where sort of there was a bit more kind of wisdom shared on what it's actually like to, yeah. to lead a church plant. And, and quite a lot of sort of time and, and love and support mm. sort of has gone into it. You know, I, I, I can't claim to be part of, you know, sort of Nicky's inner circle, yeah. but I can say he, he really backed me and invested in me when I was leading wonderful. the church plant. Wonderful, wonderful. And so you, you're a bit of a pioneer anyway, because you, <laughs> wait, I said you're the founder of, of Burning Hearts, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And I might interrupt as well, <laughs> but I'm, I'm very interested. I've seen some of the films and they're mm. top quality. So oh, just tell us about much. the vision. Well, it's, it's like often the case, a vision I'm not quite sure where it came from, other than it came from God, mm. I think, mm. I believe. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of the, the things that have happened have, have left me thinking, actually, yes, God seems to be opening doors and yeah. making it happen. But um, we're all about exploring God's word through film. So that's the sort of tagline. Yeah. And wanting to bring a sort of more uh, documentary style into Bible teaching. Mm. Um, so I, I love things like Revelation TV. Yeah, I, yeah. I love um, what we're doing here. Yeah. This feels very much the sort of thing that you'd watch on um, you know, any other That's TV, it, exactly. Netflix or the BBC or someone exactly. like that. But, but so often when it comes to sort of... A little bit of controversy uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and pushing the boundaries, but, mm. you, but obviously we're bounded by Ofcom, so we've got to behave <laughs> ourselves, but uh, you know, not, not that you're going to misbehave, but just, yeah, keep going. Well, I sort of feel that when it comes to out and out Bible teaching, mm. um, there just isn't that much high quality film out there. Yeah. So what you tend to have is, and, and I mean, thank God this is changing. So this, you know, if we go back 15 years when I, well, 20 years when I feel that God first put it in my heart and mind, mm. you know, the situation was was very different. And, and you, you know, there was, n there was no Bible teaching in a format that you'd have found on the BBC or on Netflix. Right. It was all, a sermon being filmed. That's right. And you wouldn't watch something like that. And also the quality. So I, I grew up with the Word Record Club and, you know, get, getting cassette tapes of Christian <laughs> musicians, you know, so I was pretty well versed in that. And, I, and you always knew, even though you, I loved the Christian artists, it was a lower quality. It was, mm. you know, and you, we got used to it, but it wasn't top quality. Mm. But I think that's what you're saying, that the kind of quality levels and the sort of creativity mm. has improved. I, th I think it, I mean, it really has. Um, and I mean, sometimes I grew up with delirious sort okay, of, uh, yeah. you know, as okay, a teenager, sort of with, with, with suddenly worship. So I was Garth Hewitt in the 1970s, Bryn <laughs> Howarth, you know, and a few people like that. And, you know, the second chapter of Acts from America, they were before your time. <laughs> I'm afraid that one is before, I, I recognise some of them. <laughs> But I, I mean, Delirious, mm. they were as good as anything in yes, the world. That's right. And I feel that, you know, worship music now is phenomenally creative, phenomenally high quality yeah. musically, yeah. And, and, and obviously varied. You yeah. know, some of it's brilliant, some of it, naming no names, less brilliant yeah. sort of theologically in terms of content. But I, I long to see more of that in, in Bible teaching as, as well. Yeah. And it's. Um, it's not just a question of quality. I think it's also a question of how you do it. So, um, y you know, if, you, if you're just speaking into one camera, you, you lose people's attention span quite quickly. Yeah. If you are in one location with one voice, but with a few camera angles, you, you know, that, that becomes a little bit longer, yeah. but you do still lose attention quite quickly. Yeah. And if you look at you know, documentaries on Netflix or you know, on the BBC, you'll find that they're always changing locations and you know, two minutes here, three minutes there. And, and sort of want, wanting to do that, but from a sort of Bible teaching point of view, because that's, that's the genre that uses the medium. Yeah. And, and you, know, you don't, you know, when you first learn how to, to write at school, they say, don't write like you talk. When you first learn how to preach, if you're a preacher, they say, don't preach like you've written an essay. Yeah. You know, each medium has its own yeah. unique way of working. And it felt to me 
that the Christian church wasn't really leaning into how film works. That's right. And, and it is and not investing. More. Not they investing. Yeah. If you look at the investment, there, there is, you know, it's, it's normally outliers like yourself yeah. or others, you know, pioneers or mm. parachurch type things that are getting on with it rather than these very wealthy, you know, mainstream churches. They tend not to invest. Although I, f funny enough, I've, correct me because I'm just well, I had, a, had a meeting with a guy from IVP sort yeah. of, um, a few years back and, and was talking this through and I had something of a light bulb moment because I mean I, I suppose I, I often say to people I want more competitors you know I want mm. more people who are doing what I'm doing and if I get lost in the noise if Burning Heart nobody watches it yeah. because there's so many other good things yeah. out there hallelujah yeah. wonderful Brilliant. but at the moment there isn't quite yeah. enough there yeah. And I was talking to him because obviously, you know, IVP, they're a book publisher for right. those watching who don't know. And if I want to write a book, I know exactly what to do. Um, now, obviously, I need to learn because I'm not experienced. But, you know, first of all, writing is something which feels familiar. I then will pitch an idea to IVP and they'll put me in touch with an editor and they'll take me through the process and they'll help with things like typesetting and cover design and marketing and distribution and printing and there's a lot of there's a lot of cost and a lot of expertise mm, exactly. in in that mm. which I I couldn't do myself but but they do it for me but when it comes to film there's there's nothing really like That's that true. And even quite big churches, you, you know, the, the cost of making an episode in the sort of style that we, that we do it is in, in the thousands. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I sometimes say, I think people sometimes think it's, in, you, you know, the Alpha film series, for instance, would cost millions and is yeah. amazing, but yeah. you can do it, I think, on a lower budget. Right. But even that lower budget, you know, how big a church do you need to be before you say, oh, let's put 20,000 pounds in our budget for a film series, yeah. um, which all are, small groups are going to use for one term and you're the treasurer at this point is going I'm, I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's right mm. but likewise if you said well can we self-publish a book which would cost thousands maybe tens yeah. of thousands the treasurer would probably say oh no 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 but we need books right. you know we need the Christian paperback yeah. so over sort of a century or more we've more probably we've had that system bubble up yeah. so that we know how to do it in a way that doesn't require it to be fully funded by an individual or a church. Yeah. And I long to see so that it more. it sounds like you need to set up a training program. <laughs> to get, yeah. no, get not quite there yet. Oh, but I'd, love, yeah, I'd love to see yeah. much more in this Yeah, area. no, I, t I totally agree because it's all about content. And if yeah. it's just about, you know, techniques, it's, you, mm. know, you need the message. Um, so tell us a little bit about your content and what, what, what do you focus on? Because I know that I've, wa I've wa I watched your one on Jeroboam and you've just told me earlier that that was the first one you yeah. did. But just tell me, what, what, what is it that guides you into, because there's a lot in the Bible mm. you could focus on. I mean, th the honest answer is I, I pray about it and it's what's sort of on my heart at a, ta at, mm. at a time. Mm. Um, I mean, it's a little bit like the, 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 the vicar choosing the sermon series. You, you know, I... I have a little bit of a kind of grid in my mind that I want us to teach the whole of Scripture. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you, you know, oh, we haven't done, you know, this or, or that. You know, we've done our, our latest series was on Daniel and you know, it was our first prophet. Yeah. Um, but and by the way, you, you don't just do the programme. You do a study guide. You, you know, there's a yes. lot of packaging around, which is yes. brilliant to do that. I mean, well, funny enough, that, that's partly because we hope that they can be used by small groups as yeah. well as by individuals. Yeah. But also partly, uh, this is a sort of sidebar, when you, when you make a film series, you, you want to focus on, on the heart of it. Mm -hmm. And there's always extra stuff that some people are interested in. So with Daniel, there's a big debate on who wrote Daniel and yeah. why. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, and when. Who wrote Daniel and when? And, you know... For, for most, and why? Yeah, I, often well, yes, it's well, because they don't want to believe that it was written before or was prophetic. Well, there, there's these two yeah. these yeah. two views. Either Danny was written when it claims to be written in the sixth century, yeah. but if it was written then, then God is real because yes. the the prophecy is so accurate. scarily detailed and accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And just and, interjecting on that, I, when you have secular historians saying yeah. that. I, I, Tom Holland, for instance, I'm sure I read something that he wrote and just said it is a, just a remarkable, you know, you know, 
yeah. supernatural book. It, it, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know the quote. But yeah, no, it sounds I, like no. You. I'm the paraphraser because <laughs> I'm on ad lib TV here, so I, I don't know the quote. But I remember reading. It may not have been him, but when I read that, I thought, okay, they've clocked on to the fact yeah. that it is amazing. Well, and, and I think you know many of the skeptical scholars are actually open about that. You yeah. know, I've come across Bible scholars who say, well, of course, I think Daniel is written in the second century BC yeah. because you know, it's impossible to predict this stuff in advance. Yeah. And I don't believe in yeah. God, so therefore it's late. Yeah. But I don't want to make a, a film series on that. First of all, discussing authorship and dating of books is very difficult to bring That's to life right. on the screen. That's true. But also, I reckon there's about 10% of the people who are watching are like, tell me when it was, you know. Can I just tell you, I know it's the, I'm supposed to be interviewing you, but uh, um, Chris Hitchin, in the early days of uh, Rev TV, he wrote an email in one of his sort of, you know, jibing emails. <laughs> and, and so I, I wrote back and, it, uh, um, and then he gave me a tirade from most of the books of the Bible. It's a very, <laughs> very long um, email, but he missed out Daniel. So I gave an equally long one on Daniel because I knew he was interested in, you know, the, the East West, you know, mm. and the sort of history of the, you know, yeah. the Orthodox Church and all of that. And he, he just said, very clever. He wrote back, you know, so you can. It's a very engaging book. Yes. Um, and and so, so, so I suppose yeah, finishing on the sidebar, I've, I've written a long essay that's on our website, mm. who wrote Daniel and when, so that if you're one of the 10 percent of people who are like, oh, but do you know, but do you know this, do yeah. you know that, aren't you going to tell me this? The beauty of a, of a resource like that, that mm. with a website, is you can just go and read that. Yeah. But I didn't have to put it into the films. Yeah. And the films are more on the why. The, yes. the films are more on, you, you know, trying to unpack what the message of Daniel is. That's good. And I think often, I think often with books like Daniel, we can get sidelined into an academic debate. That's right. Which isn't actually what God is trying to say to us through that yeah. that. Yeah. bit of the Bible. Yeah. Um, so, but also there are some intriguing pointers to the end. You know, close mm. up the book until the end. You're, you're not ready yet for the, you know, this mind-blowing yes. revelation <laughs> of what's going to happen. And even Daniel wasn't ready for it. I mean, I have to say, I find that quite encouraging. Yes. In, in chapter 12, <laughs> yes. he says, I, I saw, but I did not understand. Exactly. And yeah. I was thinking, oh, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not the only one who, who sometimes looks at the end of Daniel, which I love. I mean, I think the end of Daniel is incredibly important and incredibly powerful. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a sadness to me that we don't look at it more. Mm. But I don't think I know anybody who can look at the end of Daniel and say, I 100% can tell you exactly what every little detail yeah. is about. There's a lot of, no. okay, I see the broad brush, that's right. But that bit I don't quite understand. Also, the spirit. I'm sorry, I'm getting no, no, digging in now. Good. But the spiritual dimension. You know that, that when when he he talks in in Daniel 10 about warring with the the principality of Persia and Greece, and I think of our world today, it's still going mm. on. It this is absolutely war with I mean, these principalities. Yes, mm. I mean I always think of. Um, Paul in Ephesians 6 as mm. well, that our battle is not yes. against flesh and blood, yes. but against the powers, the principalities, yeah. the authorities. And you, you suddenly stop and you think, I don't know about you, it helps me to see the people who we might be disagreeing very strongly yeah. with in a different light. Yeah. You know, I think we Definitely. often see their enemies and, and you know, we talk about culture wars and yeah. we want to get them. Yeah. And no, no, they are, they are often wrong. They are often deluded, trapped in their sort of, you know, understanding, but fundamentally, A, they are made in the image of God and right, he loves just them and he that. wants to redeem yeah. them. Yeah. And so we should love them and really love them. Mm. And B, actually they're not the prime mover, it's, it's yeah. the powers and the principalities. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but when I look at it like that, suddenly I see someone who, you know, maybe, the, maybe they're looking at me with hatred, yeah. But actually, I realise yeah. if I'm a follower of Jesus, I can't hate yeah. you. Or at least if I do, I'm wrong. Yeah, victims of a culture or an ideology or yeah. something that you know they've grown up in or been yeah. indoctrinated in. So therefore, you know, but we believe that everyone can come to a knowledge of the Lord. Mm. So we try to stick to the knowledge of the Lord rather yeah. than you know. I mean, I, what I think one of the most extraordinary bits yeah. of Daniel is chapter four, mm. which is when Nebuchadnezzar goes mad. Yeah. And, uh, and God tells him that it's going to happen because of his pride. Mm. 
uh, he, he goes mad and then he humbles himself and he acknowledges God as king and he writes chapter four. Yeah. And you think, if ever there was a man in history who was a proper enemy of God mm. and who was about as far from you know, salvation as you can imagine it, yeah. surely it's Nebuchadnezzar. You know, he's the guy who sacks Jerusalem and destroys the temple. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this, is, yeah. this is total darkness. Yeah. And yet, in the end, he comes to faith. That's it amazing. It's and, amazing. And, and there's, a, there's a beautiful grace of God there. It's not just that, you know, if I was God, I'd humble Nebuchadnezzar. I'd force him to confront, to, to admit that, that I was God, and then I'd smite him. Yeah. Um, but God doesn't. He raises him back up and he gives everything back to him. And you think, oh, what? So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is redeemable. Well, if he's redeemable, then Excellent. whoever you want to name now who exactly. you're thinking of, they can be exactly. redeemed. Um, uh, well, yes, yeah, so well, there's one other person, Belshazzar. <laughs> yes, he doesn't <laughs> get redeemed. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't come to a, such a good end, but then he didn't come to a, an he acknowledgement. He didn't acknowledge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and then, and, and then in that, there's a real challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we... Well, it reflects on all of us. Yes, but, yeah. but also, I suppose a specific challenge for us in the church in our age, yeah. in that we love the grace of God, but we don't love the judgment of God. Yeah. And you know, the message is everyone can be redeemed. There is no one who is beyond God's grace. Yeah. But the Bible is also very clear, if you reject God's grace, mm. Then there, then there is a consequence, there is yeah. judgment, and that's what we see with yeah. Belshazzar who dies. Um, and that's, I mean, you might see one of my other series is yeah. on judgment, struggling yeah. with judgment, because I've always found that really hard, mm. but I can't sidestep it, so I've got to grapple with it. And yeah. I suppose one of my, you ask how I choose themes. Yes. I think one of the things I long to do is to look at themes that your ordinary person in the pew might struggle with, yeah and partly because they don't have the time that I have to, to yeah. read up and to pray into yeah. it. But, but sort of trying to grapple with, you know, so Daniel or we've done Judgment or Deuteronomy, because these are precious parts of what God is speaking to his church through the ages, yeah. and yet we struggle to access them. So I, I, I'm often drawn to things like, what, what, why Judgment? Yeah. You know, why, why can't God just redeem Belshazzar like he seems to redeem Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. And, and the answer is, is given actually in Daniel 5. Daniel sort of, when he sort of interprets the writing on the wall, he says, um, you knew yeah. what happened yeah. to Nebuchadnezzar. So you knew That's and it. you rejected God. Yeah, very good. Um, it's brilliant chatting because, um, you know, there's, I, I, my, my kids are now in their 20s, but they're often, even in their university years, they go to some churches in London and, and they weren't giving enough depth. They would, the gospel message was there, it was, it was as though it was only the gospel message, the, the, the basic, simple, sort of Billy Graham type message. And, and yet our discussion shows there's just so many layers. And so you're, uh, are, you, are you seeking to uh, not only build up the church, but also reach beyond. Um, how, what's the target of the films? I mean, no and yes. I mean, so the target is very much your ordinary Christian. So it's, it's I was going to say it's aimed at yeah. you. It's, Me. It's, I'm um, very ordinary, by the uh, way. Well, I was that's about a, to say, no, you're that's not. My, that's, <laughs> that's my sort of ident, isn't it? Your ordinary Tim. Um, yeah. but, but it's, so it's not aimed at sort of pastors and theologians, although yeah. hopefully they could read it with yeah. things, but also it's not aimed at, at evangelism because yeah. it, it's a discipleship resource. Yeah. Um, I suppose you've got to be pretty committed mm. um, if you want to do a series on Deuteronomy or, or yeah. Daniel or something yeah. like that, but you don't need to be knowledgeable, hopefully. So anybody who wants to go deeper with God, it's a resource for them. And I, and, and I think sort of, I've, I've wrestled a bit with, with those sorts of questions yeah. because, you know, 100 years ago, everyone went to church. That's right. And, and also everyone in your congregation would be there for the next 50 years or had been there for the, depending on how yeah. old they were. So you, you, Sunday was the great moment for the saints to dig into the word of God. Mm. But now it's also the great shop window yeah. and it's when the non-Christians come. Yeah. Now, there's a big debate and I don't want to go, go in, in there mm. 
as to whether we should just always be doing gospel presentations or whether we should be digging down and letting the non-believer kind of listen in. Yeah. And I think there's good, good things yeah. in both. But if, if we are making Sunday our shop window, well then, when are we doing the deep discipleship? When are we teaching people yeah. Deuteronomy and things like that? Yeah. And, and I feel, I mean, going back to one of the things we were talking about earlier, I think film is such an opportunity yeah. Yeah. because I don't know many small group leaders who would have the inclination, uh, the expertise, or the time that would be needed to come up with a small group series on Deuteronomy. That's it, um, exactly. But if you've got films on Deuteronomy, then all they need to do You've always got time to watch films, yeah. haven't they? Or, or, or yeah. you know, it, it, it suddenly it makes running a small group really easy. You just yeah. put a film on, you press play, yeah. and you read the, the questions. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't need to be mine. You know, there are, as, as I said, more and more things out there. I mean, we, uh, we'd run out of my films. So my small group, we did some Bible project films, um, you know, yeah. last, last term. And, and it, was, it was brilliant. And you... And, you know, you know, so suddenly it's easy to do really quite deep discipleship, mm. um, even if you don't know what it is, it, yeah. almost particularly, you, you sort of, you watch your sort of film series, you know, we, you know, we do one on Obadiah or something like that in the Bible brilliant, project. Brilliant story. And then you say, well, okay, well, none of us know anything about yeah. this. Well, yeah. here are the questions. What do you think? Yeah. And, and you can dig into brilliant. it. Um, so I'm, I'm really passionate about trying to make believers go deeper into the so Bible. So a burning heart, we're in the last minute, is Sorry. that your burning? No, it's wonderful. Is it your burning heart or what, have you got another meaning behind it? It comes from Luke 24, the yeah. disciples on the road to Emmaus and they say, were not our hearts Excellent. burning within us as Jesus uh, opened the scriptures uh, and talked to us on the road. And our prayer is that we open the scriptures and then everyone else watching meets with God and their hearts burn within them. Fantastic. And how foolish you are not to believe all of the prophets. So you've got <laughs> exactly. a big job on, haven't you, to bring all that together. We do. <laughs> um, David Ingle, you work with your wife, Liz. Yes. And, yes. Um, and you've got a great team behind you. So thank you for all that you do. And I've really enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing some of your programmes on Christian TV channels as well. But Amen to that. Bless you. <laughs> Thanks, David. God bless you. And thank you also for joining us. Uh, see you next time when we go face to face.